Hello everyone, welcome to the fifth and final day of adventures in Red Rover. This is my sister's 2017 Chrysler Pacifica. I flew into Chicago, where my sister lives, borrowed the van, which of course she allowed <laughs> and encouraged, I didn't steal it. And then for the last several days I've been driving around and exploring Illinois and the surrounding states. And right now I'm in one of those surrounding states. I'm actually in Tennessee. I camped last night in Kentucky, drove this morning into Tennessee, and I'm excited because I've never been here before. This is my first time ever in Tennessee, and it's going to be a very brief visit. I'm going to see and do exactly one thing here, but I'll be visiting multiple states in this video, so it should be fun. And speaking of things that I've never done before, I've never been to a Civil War battlefield before. Well, that's not true. I've been to one. I've been to Gettysburg before. When I was a kid, we took a family trip to Gettysburg. I've never filmed a Civil War battlefield. That's what I meant to say. And so I'm at one of those right now. I'm at Fort Donelson National Battlefield. This was a battle site relatively early in the American Civil War, 1862 to be exact. And this is a noteworthy spot because this is where the Union troops gained their first major victory in the Western theater of the war. So up until this point, there had been pretty much disaster in the East. Lincoln had ineffective generals in the Eastern part of the war. And then in the West, things hadn't been much better until right before this battle when Union troops captured Fort Henry, which is just west of here along the Tennessee River. Uh, casualties there were relatively low, under 100 on each side, so it's not really considered a major battle. This is considered a major battle, and this is considered the first major victory of the Union in the Civil War. This was kind of a turning point in the early years of the war. And some famous names were involved. The most famous you've undoubtedly heard of, General Ulysses S. Grant, at the time of this battle, he was a brigadier general. As a result of his victory here, he was promoted by Lincoln from brigadier general to major general. So let's go uh, explore some of the, the site here. So Fort Donaldson wasn't really what you would think of when you think of a fort. It wasn't made out of brick or stone. It was made out of earthworks like this. So this was a Confederate built fort built with slave labor and soldier labor. They built up big berms, big artificial ridges like this with pits behind them. So they would dig the, the dirt out of here and pile it up here. The fort was established because of its strategic location on the river here. This is the Cumberland River, and this was an important supply and transportation artery for the Confederacy. And over here, this is where the Confederate artillery was, the battery of, of artillery pointing out toward the river to uh, protect the fort and to protect the river. On the first day of fighting, the Union troops made some probing attacks toward the Confederate earthworks and the Confederate lines. On the next day, the Union troops were reinforced by even more troops. And then also the Union gunboats on the river here fired on the cannons, on the Confederate cannons. They didn't do really any damage. And then the real battle came on the next day, February 15th. The Confederate troops were surrounded completely by the Union troops. It wasn't looking good for them, and so they thought that they would beat a retreat back to Nashville. And so they punched through the Union lines, and they were going to widen the gap so that they could get out, but there was some debate in the Confederate commander ranks about what the best course of option was, and long story short, they fell back into the fort, and then the next day they surrendered, or basically they sent a, a, a message to Grant asking what the surrender terms were, and he said that there are no terms, just unconditional surrender. And so the Confederate troops unconditionally surrendered. So Grant was able to capture something like 12,000 Confederate prisoners. As far as the casualties on both sides go, I'll put uh, I'll put those numbers on the screen here so that you can see them. And this was just a huge Union victory. It gave the Union control of this river, the Cumberland River, and so between this river and the Tennessee River that they had captured at Fort Henry like a week earlier, that gave the Union these two huge watery super highways that they could use to shuttle supplies and, uh, and basically use to plan their attacks to the interior of the Confederate states. Here's a good look at the Confederate artillery pointing towards the river. 
And again, the Union gunships came up the river and uh, basically were severely harassed and turned back. These are pretty big guns. I think these are actually original cannons. I think these are the cannons from the battle. It says 1846 on the side. I think I read that, that these are the same cannons. And check out this barge going along the river here. That thing is huge and it is cruising. Ulysses S. Grant became a hero after this battle and he was portrayed in a newspaper. A drawing of him was published in a newspaper or newspapers in the north showing him with a cigar clenched in his teeth. And so he was sent thousands of cigars from his admirers, something like 5,000 cigars. He wasn't much of a smoker before that, but he started smoking because he had all these cigars laying around and that probably contributed to his later death from throat cancer, so not great. So I was driving along the road out here and I saw a sign, I don't know if you can really see it, a sign over there says bison range. And sure enough, there are bison out here. Now this is not the kind of thing I'd expect to find in Tennessee or Kentucky. I think I'm still in Tennessee. I'm almost in Kentucky, I think. I think we tend to think of bison as creatures of the Great Plains and of the West, but they used to cover the entire country, all the way up to the, the eastern states and the far eastern forests, and it's, it's crazy and it's really sad just how small they're current ranges compared to what it used to be, but apparently they used to be here, and I guess there still are a few of them here. Kind of a fun, unexpected thing to see here, but I still have an hour and a half of driving, so let me get back to that, and then I'll meet back up with you once I get to our next spot. Well, after nearly two hours of driving, it feels good to get out and stretch my legs a little bit. I'm at a place called Mantle Rock. I think it's Full name is Mantle Rock Nature Reserve or Preserve, something like that. We're gonna see and do two things here. One is Mantle Rock. The second is, well, let me show you. So the trail to Mantle Rock overlaps with the Trail of Tears. This is the forced removal of five Native American tribes from their native areas, from their homelands in the Southeast to Indian Territory in Oklahoma and also in, in western Nebraska, or not Nebraska, Arkansas, this area. And so right now I am in Kentucky. This is Kentucky. I'm like right here, about halfway. About 10,000 Cherokee came through here in 1838 and 1839, and they spent about two weeks camped in this area because they were waiting for the Ohio River, which is less than a mile over this way, to thaw enough for them to safely get ferried across. So they had just bitterly cold camping conditions here as they camped along the road. And the road, the old road, is what we're gonna be hiking along for a little ways. I'm just leaving the parking area here and this red, this is the old road and this is the original route of the Trail of Tears. And then a side trail branches off and goes to Mantle Rock. So let's walk along this way, not just for a little bit, walk along the old road for a little ways, then we'll head to Mantle Rock. It's hard to imagine the amount of human suffering that went on here along this road. And of course there's the physical suffering, the starvation, the exposure, I'm sure disease was rampant, but then also think of the psychological suffering, the, the emotional pain that those people must have been going through, being ripped from their homeland and then being taken to a, a land, a, a place that they had never seen before that meant nothing to them, that was completely different to the places they'd come from. It's just, it's just horrible. I'm gonna backtrack now and go back to the spot where 
the trail to the rock, to Mantle Rock, shoots off. That'll be something completely different to this. And uh, I hadn't even actually realized that the Trail of Tears was was along this same path that I'd be traveling along and, and hiking along. So I'm glad I was able to see this. I'm glad I was able to show it to you guys. I know it's just one little, one little pinpoint on the map of of human misery in this area, but I'm glad I was at least able to catch a glimpse of it. And here we are at Mantle Rock. This natural arch is the largest east of the Mississippi, 188 feet long and 30 feet high. If you saw the previous video, you'll know that I went to a natural arch in southern Illinois called Pomona Natural Bridge. This one is much, much larger. I think it's about time I got a wider angle lens to fit all of this in. What an amazing place. <laughs> and no one else is here. That is just incredible. I'm gonna leave this place now, leave Kentucky behind as a whole. It was a brief visit, but I'm glad I at least got to stop by. You know, a little bit is better than nothing. I'm gonna drive back into Southern Illinois. Alright guys, this will be a first for me. We're going to go on to a ferry. We're going to cross the river. I believe this is still the Ohio River. The land on the far side there, that is Illinois. This will be fun. back to dry land that was awesome so here is the the ferry I'm back on the Illinois side of things the Illinois side of the river this is where I took off from I mean that timing couldn't have gone better as soon as I pulled up to the boat ramp on the other side that's right when people started to move onto the ferry that was fantastic and it's free didn't cost anything. And I think I'm gonna go grab some curly fries because there's a little shack over here selling curly fries and I'm hungry. Yeah, we've got here pulled pork barbecue, nachos, pretzels, curly fries, and funnel cakes. This poor guy here just missed the ferry. <laughs> Guys, this is a, a massive pile of what I guess are curly fries. That is, there's no way I can eat all of those. But I did find a nice little picnic table here to enjoy the view from while I work on my mountain of fries. It's a beautiful time to be here. Just the, the lighting and the clouds. It's really, really pretty here. I don't even know how to eat these. You have to like break some off of the the hole here. They're not great. <laughs> They're cold already. They're more like chips than, than fries. Worth it for the experience. Worth it for me to, to cause me to slow down a little bit, enjoy the view. Take it all in on this last afternoon. We're not quite an evening yet. Last afternoon of my trip here. Life is good. This is great.
I was chatting with the curly fry lady while I was waiting, and she said that the ferry is operated jointly by the states of Kentucky and Illinois, and that's who it's paid by. And also you can just walk on it and ride it across, ride it back and forth uh, for free if you want to. Just like walk on, not, not drive on, but just walk on. So I thought that was kind of fun. And the ferry dropped me off into a town called Cave in Rock, Illinois. And the reason it's called that is because there's a cave here and it's in the rocks and it's called Cave in Rock. So here is the cave from the outside. Let's go on in. Now it's the history of this cave that I think is really interesting. Basically it was used as a pirate lair, as a pirate hangout, as a pirate hideout. In the late 1700s there were pirates out on the river out here, the Ohio River, and they would take shelter, take refuge in here to avoid detection. At the back of the cave here there's some light coming through a crack in the ceiling. And this is looking out. Well guys, I think that brings today's adventures and this trip as a whole to an end. I'm gonna head back to my sister's now. It's about a five and a half hour drive. Got a long road ahead of me still and I'm tired so I wanna get going here. Overall, I had a great time today and I had a great time on this trip overall. I mean, this this area, you know, Southern Illinois and getting into the surrounding states, this is just like a, like, this is a different culture. You know, this is a different world to me. This is very foreign to me. I'm not a, you know, there aren't rivers like this where I live. It's not humid like this where I live. There are mountains where I live, you know, but it's a beautiful area. I've had a great time here. I saw and did a lot of really interesting and beautiful things on this trip and I'm so happy I was able to do this. Huge thanks to my sister and her family for letting me borrow their minivan, Red Rover, for the week. Let me give you one last look at the river here from the top of this little bluff. I think this is a beautiful note to end the video on. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think. Let me know what your favorite part of today was. Let me know what your favorite part of the entire trip was. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.